been talking a lot about individual, you know, as individuals, as followers of Christ, carrying out the Great Commission. And we're going to shift that a bit to as a body, as a church, carrying out the mm-hmm. Great Commission. And uh, so a, a few weeks ago, we had uh, Brother Larry Barker on, uh, who uh, did a phenomenal job. Uh, Larry does a, a, a Zoom chat every couple of weeks, and I had the opportunity to just share with him uh, what the Lord put on my heart about the church where, where I'm replanting here locally. And he said, Jake, with what's going on in your heart, you need to reach out to Chris Driver in Texas. Well, I'm terrible at reaching yeah. out, uh, but happened to be at a at a meeting, a conference uh, a couple months ago, and someone introduced me uh, to Chris. I had the opportunity just to hear his heart. And as he's talking, really what the Lord's doing in, in his life and revealing to him about church and, and church planning is the same place I'm at. And so I'm like, I want to have you on and just let's just talk what mm-hmm. the Lord is, is putting on our hearts, because I, I think what he's going to share about church structure and how church is done, uh, one, helps us carry out the Great Commission. But and then, two, I think as difficulty comes is a model that we're probably going to have to adapt. And so at, if you're here as a church leader, I hope you really listen in. Uh, and, but no matter what, you're all, you know, all, all of us who are involved in the body, let's look at how maybe our body could have a greater impact with the Great Commission. Yes. Shirley, will you yes. introduce our guest? Yes. Chris Driver is a pastor and church planter from West Texas. He currently is planting Oasis Church in Leveland, Texas. I hope I said that right. He's been in ministry for 17 years, but through this current church plant, he's challenging the paradigm of church, adopting a model that we at Stan Firm believe is more in line with the church of the first century. And he's utilizing the discovery Bible study format. I'm looking forward. Welcome, Chris. I'm looking forward to hearing this discovery Bible study format. Welcome, Chris. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for having me. It's good to be here. So, it's good to have you from Texas. Yeah, I've enjoyed the discussion so far, man. I thought, tell you what, it's uh, it's good. It's, Isn't Jake a great teacher? Yeah, I, absolutely. And I'm going to tell you, man, this, this is hard. You know, I mean, this is, you know, this is hard teaching, just like when Jesus was, uh, you know, uh, talking to people, telling them, hey, you know, you got to drink my blood and, you know, eat my flesh. Yep. People said, man, that's hard teaching. How can I obey it? And many left him that day. And I I think we see that, you know, as we start moving forward in the true um, pursuit of the Great Commission, I think I think we see Mm -hmm. going to be struggle um, with that. And so um, one thing I would add as I listened into that um, and I was just thinking of, you know, giftedness. It always comes up. But, Mm -hmm. you know, in in Ephesians 4, 12 and 13 talks about the purpose of, you know, those gifts. And it is to the body It's to build up the body. It's to equip the saints for everything. Right. Not to do the work. Right. So just because you're gifted in evangelism doesn't mean you do all the evangelism. It means you take your gift and you teach others to do it so that they can. Ah, I've never you know what? I've never heard anybody teach that. And that is perfect. That is spot on. Thank you, Pastor. (laughs) That's the part of the body is we're here to help one another. Yes. You know, equip, encourage. And yes. Can you, can you, um, I know Jake has some questions, but can you tell us what does the discovery Bible study format is? Uh, discovery Bible study, um, is really just, I mean, there's three parts to it and, and I'll tell you what, it's been, been really life changing and ministry changing for me. Uh, just simply walking through the scripture, <laughs> you just take a piece of passage of scripture and just look at it. But really three pieces are really important to that. There's the look. Uh, look back, which is an accountability piece. Um, mm-hmm. Every time we start, we look back on what we could have done or what we should have done, what we promised to do the past week and an I will statement. And I'll talk about that in just a second. But uh, so there's a look back. We review, you know, what what we did, what we did through the week, what God's been up to, what we studied, what he's shown us. And then so that's the look back. And then there's a look up, which is the part where we just break down a piece of scripture and we just talk about it. We just just. Mm-hmm what the scripture says. And and so we just go through that again, just facilitating. I'm not preparing a 10 point, you know, message on it. I'm not, you know, even three points in a, in three poems or whatever. <laughs> yeah. I'm not doing that. I mean, we're just taking the scripture and we're together <laughs> walking through it. And I've got some, you know, it's got some questions that you ask. Basically it's an, an inductive Bible study. So you take, you take that piece and you walk through it. At the end of it, you get to the look forward, which is, what are you going to do with this, right? So we ask the question, 
what does this passage require me of me? So if this is true, if this if this is true, what I just got through re- reading, what does it require of me? Um, what must I do to be obedient to what I just read, what I just learned? Because that's again what you've talked about is you know God desires obedience above everything else, right? I mean that's what He's calling us to. And just as you said, when He shows us something, it's not a bad thing if it's a repentance. I need if there's something I'm I'm doing in my life or not doing, and I and great. That's that's not a bad thing. It feels kind of kind of bad at first, you know, when God puts his finger on something, but, hmm. but it's not bad. It's a good thing when he identifies those things in our life that need to come out or things that we need to do. And so, you know, that's that look forward. And so every time we, we come to that place is everyone leaves with an I will statement. I will, in response to God's word, hmm. I will, whatever it is, if it's, you know, maybe it is share the gospel with Joe down the street. And, you know, and so next week we come back, you know what the first thing we do? We we hold one another accountable. Last week you said you were going to share with Joe. How did that go? It, I mean, the big- this is this is this is seems like everybody should be doing it, but it seems <laughs> revolutionary too. And it seems like some people would leave the Bible study because they don't want to be no. accountable. No, no, no. I, listen, I you know if you've ever been around kids, you know, people always say, well, if you put structure, kids will rebel against. Yeah. They, they push back a little bit until they understand that you're going to actually hold them accountable. Then they thrive. That's awesome. They That's thrive. Awesome. Right. So you put boundaries and then they thrive. So I think the, I think the problem with the, with the church as it is today is we have zero expectations for our belief, our, our congregations. Yes, yes, yes. Maybe you pay your tithes, but really, as far as a personal obedience and applying the word and the truth that we preach to them every week, we have zero, zero accountability. We we don't expect them to do anything. So we've set the bar really low. And and I've learned over the years in teaching and coaching and all those things that kids mm-hmm. will live up to your expectation. If you have zero expectation, guess what? They'll live up to it. People are not, the, not, not different. I mean, if you have no expectations of obedience, guess what? they won't obey. They'll never apply it to their life. And so I actually, listen, I actually mourn this, right? So mm-hmm. over COVID, it really revealed a bunch of things to me. I mean, to everybody, I think. But one of the things that, that it revealed to me was how terrible a job we were doing at this, uh, at really expecting people to obey. And then the second piece, which is I, I learned through TTI, which is the Timothy Initiative, you know, was, was this the DBS, but also the accountability piece. In 17 years of ministry and teaching, every week I got up and I preached the word as best as I could. And I had mm-hmm. I had personal high expectations that people, I just assumed, I guess, that people would hear the truth and apply the truth. Mm-hmm. And I would move on to the next thing the next week and never go back and go, hey, how did it go last week? We talked about forgiveness. How did it go in your life? How did you mm-hmm. apply that? You know, and never come back to holding people accountable and we we view accountability as this terrible thing right i mean this terrible word you know i need it i i asked for it god asked for it the accountability is not about it's it's a wonderful thing and you do it in love so every week i don't beat people up if they didn't do well right i mean i don't i don't call them out and and you know kick them and then kick them out of the group i mean praise god he doesn't do that with us when he went get it right right i mean so what I do is I just go, how can we help with that? Right. I mean, you, you were going to share with Joe, what if we, you know, could, do you want me to come with you? Do you want me to pray with you? Mm-hmm. Uh, what can I do to help you be obedient? Right. I mean, mm-hmm. that's real accountability is, is not beating people up. Real accountability is helping lift them up to where they're supposed to be. Yes. Yes. I want you to be obedient. I want you to succeed at this. And I think that's the piece that, so when you change that perspective of accountability, it's a good thing. It's a great thing. And and people love it and they thrive under it because they've never been expected. I mean, sure. It's strange because they've never been expected to be obedient. It's a, it's a foreign concept. So I love it. I, I absolutely love it. Um, like Jake said, we may be moving to North Carolina and, and utilizing a apartment life awesome. that we talked about a few weeks ago. And I am going to use, if my husband and I do 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 a Bible study, which we probably will, I'm going to utilize this format because it's just, it's, it's necessary. Iron sharpens iron. It is. And I, I've dropped the uh, Timothy initiative uh, website there in the comments or so wherever you're viewing this, check it out. A great resource. And many of you uh, watching, you, you're familiar with discovery Bible study. If, even if you don't know it, uh, because many of you have caught the, uh, the, 
the documentary Sheep Among Wolves too about mm -hmm. the work going in, on in Iran and, and are keeping up with what's happening in Afghanistan. A lot of times you'll hear the phrase disciple making movement or DMM, but within that they're doing the Discover Bible Study uh, method. And so uh, really what we what we've been celebrating on this you know through our program and you've been many of you viewers have been celebrating is the result of discovery Bible study. And we've just recently tackled this at our church as well. And one of the, the things that I didn't expect was from uh, really the unchurched who were loving are loving the fact that it's not just me telling them what to believe it's, it's there. And I, I didn't expect mm -hmm. that part. Yeah. It's discovering, right? I mean, yes. Yeah. You know, when you actually dive into it and you allow people to discover what the word says, listen, I mean, you know, you hear from the Gideons all the time about stories about people getting saved in hotel rooms, mm -hmm. just reading the Bible. Can I tell you that the Holy Spirit is still the best teacher in the room? Amen. I, I mean, Amen. The mistake is, listen, the Holy Spirit is still the best teacher in the room. So, you know, he doesn't need us. He loves to use us, but it's still his word. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the mm -hmm. word, right? And so, you know, the, the part when we we keep all the word to ourselves and how to study the Bible. And we've never really taught people how to study the Bible. Um, I, I think we've done a dis, disjustice to an injustice to people because, um, you know, we've, we've really, it kind of lends itself to this idea of the danger. I think of a professional pastor is, is this, this idea that the people on the stage are the only ones who can do it. Um, right. Correct. I you and I can't do that. Right. So, I mean, I'm just a, I'm just an audience member. And so yes, my only job is to consume, right? So you did, mm -hmm. prepared, I'll take it in, I'll consume it. But really to not teach them how to be self feeders is, is um, I think, I, listen, I, I felt like it was sinful on my part. Honestly, I, I repented of it. I just felt like mm -hmm. and you know, at the very least contributed to it, this consumerism, yeah. at the very worst I had caused it. And so, yeah. And I, this is the, one of the things that I've been wrestling with is when we started down this idea for, um, you know, Oasis and what it might look like and, you know, was just mm. I started with, with the problem. What I saw is the problem and that was consumerism. And so, you know, in, in America, it's a it's a terrible problem. We, you know, been fighting it since I've been in ministry, nearly 20 years of ministry. It's been the same mm. thing, whether we blamed, you know, laziness or busyness or whether we let you know we blame little league baseball or <laughs> oh i mean you know called it you know you know the devil and you know whatever you know we, you know social media is the new one we blame social media we we blame you know TikTok or whatever you know people's attention spans or i don't know listen the one thing we've never really took a step back and said hey well maybe we've got a part in this is maybe we've never looked at the church and said what part are we playing in this Oh, you know, I, 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 I've been, studied the brain and studied learning and teaching and stuff. And when you said people discover on their own, I know it's the Holy Spirit, but when somebody has, I guess, you know, discovered something instead of just consumed it, it sticks with them longer. Absolutely. It's, it's, and, and it gives them a drive to discover more. It's like me when I go out treasure hunting, I discover something and I want to discover more and more and more. Absolutely. But when I can, yeah, when I consume something, it's, it's different. Absolutely. And it, that's brilliant. Thank you so much for, for your honesty about and, um, repenting. Yeah. And, and I want to hear what, what you're doing with, with this, because you shared with me, you're doing it in all of your uh, basically gatherings. And I've started, so we're doing this, we have evangelistic missional small groups that are doing this method. Uh, but I'm trying to do that in, in lieu of preaching. And what I have found is people remember the the word now, like before yes. they're remembering like my story of sitting next to somebody on a plane or, or my last hunting trip, you know, now it's, and I, I say here in my own family, you know, my wife, you know, is talking about the scripture from the sermon, my kids, you know, and it's the scriptures resonating more uh, than Amen. what I would say. And I mean, and, and also, I think this is probably something that you've had to wrestle with through it with too. It's also for a, the leader, for the pastor, it's, it's, we have to humble ourselves with it because it is. We, yeah. It's, I had to wrestle with, okay, Jake, is it about, I mean, cause basically you're saying I, I'm done preaching. I'm done trying to be a preacher. 
I'm just going to let the word work. I mean, it sounds, it sounds silly saying it out loud, but it's a struggle. Man, and I tell you what, that is one thing that that over the last few months in, in really incorporating this that I have struggled with and I really, really identified as maybe the bigger problem. I blamed everything else and everybody else and that they should be getting this when the reality is I think I had more to blame, more blame on me than anybody else. Yeah. I actually really like the fact that, you know, I get to, to spend 15, 20 hours a week and I get to put this huge, wonderful, amazing presentation and people walk out and go, man, that was a good, I can move people emotionally and mm -hmm. I can walk out and I can feel good about myself, you know? And the thing is, I have really robbed them of the opportunity to learn how to discover God's word for themselves. And, and, and i tell you what, I, I mean, it's one thing that, that I'm, I mean, I think we have to look at ourselves and go as, as leaders, as pastors, that maybe we're, we're part of the problem in producing consumers because we've, that's all we've done. I mean, we spend our week doing that and then we give it to them. We crunch it up so small till they, they, you know, I mean that, I, I don't know, but it's a, yeah. what we've done, you know, I, 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 like I said, I just really felt like I needed to repent from that. And just, I, I started with the problem, worked my way mm -hmm. backwards. One of the things I looked at was even how you set up a room. I mean, you know, when you go watch a football game, where do you sit? I mean, you sit in rows, you sit in a stand, yeah. you look down at the professionals playing, out on the field, right? So if you go to a concert, where do you sit? I sit in the rows. I look look up at the stage where everybody, the professionals do their job and and I watch them do their job. And so even I think the setup of a room can contribute to that. Now, I'm not saying everybody has to change all of that. And I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm just saying when I backed the train up and I started looking at things, I looked at what can I change that might be contributing to that? I just had to ask the hard question. And so I, that's what I said. So we're going to be setting up, even in our worship services, more of a casual gathering, but tables um, where, where we're studying together. They're, when they walk in, they're going to know I'm going to be a participant, not a consumer. Now, I'm just not going to yeah. be an audience member. I'm going to be a participant in what happens here today. Not the performer, the participant. Absolutely. And so, so they're going to come in. They're going to be, they're going to participate from start to finish. We're going to do, we're going to walk through, you know, the... Uh, mm -hmm. You know the the whole dbs format the look back look up look forward we're going to do that throughout our worship service uh but you know during the the actual teaching time it will be discussion based it will not be you know just a proclamation from me it will be discussion based and we will discover the word for it because i and, and i wanted to keep it consistent so what i did was i took the dbs method and i i just applied soap and i don't know if you can see behind me but Here's so, yeah, my sister does that. Yeah. And so it's easy, right? And so it's, it's somebody can easily take that. Well, I applied some of those, those DBS questions to the soap, the, the observation part of soap, which if you've never done soap, it's scripture, observation, application, prayer, right? And so, so, so in doing that, we just said, I didn't want to teach one thing here, one thing over here. So what I was, I just said, soap is going to be our tool. It's going to be our discipleship, uh, mm -hmm. in, so we're going to just use that in every piece. So we're going to, what I do on, on, on Sunday nights right now, our, we've got about 25 people meeting in my home. And so we, we, we soap a scripture together. We just <laughs> soap that scripture together. Washing of the word. <laughs> and I, I'm teaching them how to feed themselves. So they, right. they're observing it. They're participating in it. Now I release them to go back the rest of the week and do it themselves. Right. And so we come back and we check, how did your week go? We get to share what God's shown us. And we do it again. Again, this is the emphasis. When we move to Sunday mornings and we do an actual worship service, guess what we're going to do? We're going to soap scripture on Sunday morning. And, and the reason is this. Sunday morning, and I love Sunday morning, and I love worship, and I love participating, and I, I love just being together with my brothers and sisters in Christ. But when it comes to the Word of God, Sunday morning is not any more mm -hmm. Tuesday morning. Yeah. Right? I'm mm -hmm. sitting at my home in Tuesday yeah. morning. I'm, I'm diving into the word. Sunday morning is not more important than Tuesday morning. God can speak just as clearly on Tuesday morning. Amen. Sunday morning. Now, listen, gathering on the Lord's day is absolutely critical to the body of Christ. Hear me in that. We need to gather. Quit watching online. Get in the church. Be with your brothers and sisters in Christ. I know the pandemic and I know it's scary and all those things. Gather with believers because you can't get online what you can in person you just need to, okay so i'm gonna emphasize that if it's at all possible do that don't take the the easy road out or whatever it is 
gather together because it's that important. But I'm going to say that when we gather together, all right, I mean, we get what we can do, but the rest of the week is just as important. We should be in the word every single day. And Amen. I'm, our people are, are, we've got about, I guess about 12, 12 adults right now. I mean, they are loving it. They, I mean, just every day I've given them a soap schedule and, you know, we have a text group and we're like, Hey, this is what I learned today. And, you know, mm-hmm. Just sharing. I mean, you know, and and we're on track and we're staying. And so guess what happens? So we go through our week. You know, if we did Mark one through, you know, six, we started on Sunday with Mark one. Guess what happens on the next Sunday? We're on Mark eight. I I don't it's nothing new. I'm not preparing. We're, We're on schedule. And so it's just part of the process of disciple making. Right. It's it's that whole corporate. We're in this together, not. It's not this individual endeavor, I think, is discipleship. Yeah. We looked at it and we've, we've kind of said, okay, discipleship is this individual task that you have to do. But yeah. is, I think it's easier and better corporately if we can together come, mm-hmm. to help, you know, iron sharpens iron. If we can come together and we can work through things and we're doing this together, it's so much better. Again, that accountability piece. But uh, Amen. Uh, exactly what you, Jesus did. Yeah. He you mentioned, sent, and then he yeah. sent him out. Yeah. And you've mentioned also just how simple and being able to repl- replicating this. Um, I, I'm wondering in, in your thoughts towards the Great Commission, making disciples, uh, how important it is to have something that can be replicated by everybody. My, my goal is, is for me, for everybody in the church to ask, why are we paying this guy? We don't need him. We can do this. I mean, that's the goal I want to get to. Uh, I mean, I hope they're not. You I need the money, Jake. Epic, you need the money. <laughs> yeah, well, true. But, uh, but at the same time, how do you replicate that? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I <laughs> have. To speak to that, I, I actually have a really unique opportunity right now because I, I my plan is to never take a salary from the church. I mean, amen. I work for a missions department, you know, which is great, but um, I would love to set it up in such a way because where we're planting churches is rural West Texas. Okay, so um, we have these kind of semi larger groups, pockets of people, you know, about twelve, you know, eight to twelve thousand. But my heart is for the people of my, my hometown is actually 125 people. And then I live there. And so there's under it's a farming community. And so nobody's gonna plant a church in 125 people. The ceiling is really low, right? Right. right. So current church planting model. So how do we get that to them? And it has to be reproducible, right? I can't go to you know a hundred small communities in West Texas. So it has to be something that's reproducible. And again, if I'm teaching one thing versus, you know, three or four different things, and here's our tool for this, and here's our tool for ladies, and here's our tool for men, and here's our tool for kids. And, you know, if I'm teaching all these things, it's not really reproducible. But if I'm teaching one thing and it's simple, then I can teach you know, my friend to do it. And guess what? He can lead a study. He can, all he has to do is facilitate a study in his hometown. And and Mm -hmm. so, I mean, it opens the door for reaching places that, that we would never, because until we wait for somebody who's super gifted and maybe there's enough people there that they can finally support him financially, Mm -hmm. wait for that. I mean, you know, I live where nobody's going to come to 125 people and say, man, we're going to plant a church here. So we have to look at it in a, in a wholly, you know, just completely different mindset and go, how do we get that to them? Well, the best way is to equip the ones that, you know, are faithful and send them out to their, you know, this is what they do overseas. Right. I mean, yep. I mean, simply, I mean, you, you want indigenous people planting churches and yet mm-hmm. here in America, we want to train professionals to go to places and plant churches. Yeah. And that's not, it would make way more sense just to teach people how to replicate, you know, what you're doing and then let them go to their oikos, their home. And and I would say this, you talk about evangelism and, you know, uh, you know, the discussion came up earlier, and, you know, as y'all were talking about, listen, we have, you know, our, our goal is not to do just mass marketing or any of those things. It's simply this oikos. We just, we just. The first thing when somebody comes in, we have them write down all the people they know that don't know Jesus or are far from Jesus, that they're unchurched and don't know Jesus. And guess what we do? They write them down. They go through their phone contacts. However it is, we got some tools that we can use to help them get that, you know, but identifying people that that may not know Jesus. And then we say, start praying for them by name and then start having conversations with them. Mm. Start practicing hospitality. 
have them over to invite them into your life. And this is a big piece I think is missing in the churches is that yes. of hospitality and, and that we, we go to church, we, we do church at church, but after that, I don't want anything to do with you. We don't see the body of Christ the rest of the week. I mean, Pastor, can can I ask you to, and maybe Jay can elaborate on this too, because I've I've heard Christians say, well, we're not supposed to be di dining with sinners and hanging out with sinners, and you know, we're not supposed to be doing that. So do, do, I'm sure you've heard it. Both of you have heard that before. Can you speak to that? I, let me just say this. Uh, I, this is what I tell people. Listen, you cannot impact what you do not engage. Hmm. Oh, I like that. <laughs> Mark the tape, David. If you don't touch them, you can't reach them. Yeah. And so, I mean, I don't know what else you do. I mean, you know, we have, again, this goes to that Oikos. We, we, we want to put on this big event and invite people in mass. And we want to share the gospel in mass when really the most effective way is one on one. I'm not saying those things don't have their place and they can't work. I'm just saying the vast there are, I've got 12 people. They know more people, more lost people than we could ever reach, really, honestly. Yeah. I mean, yes. They know yeah. more lost people in those 12 people than we could fill up. We, we couldn't hold them in my house if they all got saved, right? I mean, and so so we, we look for these mass things when really you already know lost people. So just go and engage them, right? Go share the gospel. And so we, one of the things we do as part of our review time is we do but what skills review we do how to share your story so we each one some somebody practices their story every week their testimony and then how cool. to story I, I teach them how to do the three circles method how to simply walk through a, a simple evangelism tool and then guess what now you've got the tools you need go have a conversation invite them into your life spend time with lost people have them into your home show them the love and and of christ you know, not just say the words, but actually show it to them, engage them, let God be the one who changes them. You can't change them. Just speak truth. Let, you know, let God do the changing and, you know, open that door. I'm not saying it works every time. Many times you get rejected. That's fine, too. I mean, I, it's fine. But I can still love on people and I can still yeah. have home and I build those relationships. I just recently built a relationship with a young man going through a tough time and uh you know was able just started with praying praying for him because uh, of something that was happening in his life and so you know had dinner with him and his wife the other night with my wife and you know just building that relationship and, and i mean that's that's as simple as it gets i mean and, and but you have to be willing and that's not something we've we've told people just come to this building on sunday morning and that's all that's required of you and and so I think we've got to stretch that and change that and go, let's, let's try something new. Uh, I mean, because I, I just, the other's broken. So I don't know. <laughs> so where do we get these tools, Jake and pastor, where do we get these tools? Say like there's a pastor watching and he wants these tools to, uh, to implement in his church. So I've put the link to the Timothy online, uh, dot org that was mentioned Timothy initiative. Uh, we'll try to get a link out as well for, uh, uh, Many are familiar with that Sheep Among Wolves film I, I mentioned. Uh, they're also doing some training uh, also along the Discovery Bible Study method. Uh, so I'll try to get that link in there as well. Uh, now, Chris, you mentioned a tool that y'all use to help people gather names. Uh, is that something that's available? Uh, it's I actually got it from um, the uh, Timothy Initiative. They, okay. can, they have you write down just all the names, just list them in a list. Yeah. Um, there are some other things that we've used uh, off of our multiplication training that we do at the, the BMA of, of Texas. Um, it actually has some, basically you identify your areas of influence. Like I, I go to the gym. Okay. So then you, uh, everybody, you know, at the gym who doesn't know, you know, Christ, you put them in there. And, you know, if I go, you know, golfing, you know, I have a golfing one cause I love to play golf. And so all the guys that I know that, that, that I play golf with that don't know Jesus, they're on that list and I pray for them. And so, but really it's just, I mean, you could go through your phone, go through Facebook, all your friends. Yes. I, mean, it's, I mean, you've got so many lists everywhere. Yep. The, the intentionality is just to put them down, start praying for them, and then actually do something about it. Engage them somehow, invite them into your life, invite them into, you know, some sort of thing you like to do. I mean, again, I, I'm not, none of this is new, new with me, right? <laughs> right. I mean, I'm just, I mean, I've pieced things together, but, 
at some point you actually got to do something, right? And I think that's right. got to the hold up. That's I, I, absolutely. Um, we have four. You know, we have three and a half, four minutes. Uh, Jake, yeah. did you have another question? Yeah. I, well, I, I want to touch on the, the do something because, um, and, and Chris, I know you would absolutely agree. Ultimately, this, this comes down to praying for those open doors and praying for people. We, we're going to get more moved in prayer than us doing something. And at our churches, we've just launched out into this. I, I've got to admit, I did not push prayer at the forefront because a lot of times we get hung up just praying and we never do something. Lord, please send somebody my way. And we never do it. But we're going to come back now that we've taken the steps and make sure we're, we're you know, making prayer a big part of the component. But like you said, just do something. Uh, Chris, this has been absolutely incredible. Thank you, If Chris. you just have a minute, I, I just want to get your thoughts here. Of course, you know, a lot of our, our focus is, is on, you know, as challenges come in our life, uh, you know, you know what we've experienced with COVID. It mm -hmm. seems to me, for one, if, if people caught the teaching last night, uh, Jesus is mission strategy it's what you're doing i mean he just went poured into some you know told the disciples pour into somebody and then let them run with it it's, it's what you're doing but how can you think this could help churches survive difficulty like we've seen with covid well th that was the the main thing that covid taught me i looked around and ministry shouldn't have stopped right i mean honestly right. because we couldn't gather in large gatherings but you know what if i were just dedicated to this oikos evangelism if, if that was the only pe only thing i knew how to do ministry wouldn't have stopped yeah. right i mean if i had that tool if i had that as part of what i do as my lifestyle i still knew people we, we could still have them over in small gatherings to our lot into our, into our life i could still reach out to them individually i could still show hospitality i could show, still love on people i could still do ministry if i had been equipped if all of our people had been equipped to to just do that piece I guarantee you ministry wouldn't have stopped during COVID. It, it wouldn't have stopped right. because we could right. have still been sharing the gospel. We still should. But when we didn't have the church to go, the church building to go gather in, it, it was people panicked. I, I don't know how to do ministry. And again, you know, because we had limited what it means to be a Christian to what happens on Sunday morning. Yes. People had no idea how to do it otherwise. They had zero idea. I, I don't know how to be a Christian without sending yeah. and so what did we do well we as fast as we could put online services up right we mm -hmm. teach, our church planners one thing we, we teach them one of the things we share is is it's like playing chess so professional chess players when they learn to play chess will take the queen off the board because it's the most powerful piece right so they take the queen off the board and they learn to play chess with all the other pieces and then they put the queen back on the board and they're they're amazing i mean they can they can defeat you in so many ways right well that's really what happened was we took the queen off the board but we didn't know how to use the other people <laughs> we, uh, we, yes we, great analogy yes. no idea how to do ministry without the sunday morning service again it's powerful it's part of our culture in america i mean i'm not saying i mean we need it it's it's power, it's an important piece but if that's all we have we are really playing you know one hand tied behind our back because yes. so much every other part i mean all of life happens really outside of that one hour on sunday morning Honestly, yes i mean yes our whole Amen. life is just outside Amen. of the how can we get people back into just doing ministry again amen right amen. Not, not watching not being consumers not but actually being participants in the great commission and that's amen that, so Hallelujah. Well, we, we ran out of time. Chris, thank you so much. I, I'm really excited to start a Bible study this way. <laughs> <laughs> That's absolutely incredible, man. It really is. It's, it's, it's easy. Anybody can do it. So Jake, any final words? Well, Chris, I want to thank you so much for coming on, taking time out to, to do this. I, I wish we had more time because yes. I, I think also your background in coaching, you mentioned probably has something to do with this too. I heard a coach one time who became a pastor say, you know, if, if we did church, like if we did, he was a wrestling coach. He said, if we wrestled and I coached my wrestlers like we do church, we would just be in the team meeting all the time and never practice what we do and never yes. go do it. Yes. And that's that's what yes. we are. We're just in this repeatedly yes. team meeting, watching game film and never getting out there. And so appreciate what you're doing. That's a great analogy. Thank God you. bless you. And everybody join us again next week. And don't forget to watch Jake next Thursday evening.